Hello, everyone. My name is Mr. Minnick. Uh, today I am joined by my fourth period statistics class, and um, they're just excited to be here. They'll tell you how happy they are. So, uh, in, in light of uh, last week's holiday, they're still kind of uh, basking in Hootie Hoo Day. That was about a week ago. But today what we're talking about is the binomial distribution, the binomial distribution. And I'll be honest, when I sat down to read over this, and up to this point in statistics, I have yet to read over anything because I'm familiar with most of the concepts. I did have to reread over this because it's been a while since I've looked at this material. Um, and as I was reading it, I realized, you know, it's it's nothing that difficult. It's just the fact that we combine a lot of stuff that we just did that we might not know how to do very well yet, and we have to know how to do it very well to do it. Does that make sense? We've talked before about math being sequential, math being a combination of stuff you did from two weeks ago with stuff you did from last week with stuff you did from six months ago. This is no different, no different. So I think along the way we're going to use um, some various colored backgrounds here. It's been a long time since I've used the uh, the chalkboard effect. So there's a chalkboard effect, yeah. So the binomial distribution. Um, let me get, let me make the background. Uh, the format. I want to format the background. The page background. There we go. All right, so prerequisite knowledge. Pre, can you see that okay? Prerequisite knowledge. Stuff that you're going to need to apply that you've previously seen. Stuff that you're going to need to apply to what we're going to talk about today. Prerequisite knowledge. Uh, factorials. You're going to need to know what factorials are. And in a minute, we'll talk about them again, even though we already did. Binomial coefficients. Binomial coefficients. You may or may not have done binomial expansions in the past. So... New stuff. New stuff is going to be uh, Bernoulli trials. Bernoulli trials. And also the binomial distribution. What is a binomial distribution, actually? Binomial distribution. When I saw the definition of it, I couldn't believe it. because it's a definition of something we've already done. So you need to know about factorials. You need to know about factorials. You need to know about binomial coefficients. The new stuff is Bernoulli trials and the binomial distribution. Um, there's also one more prerequisite knowledge, something you're going to have to be familiar with, and that is a probability distribution. Okay, Probability distribution. And making those calculations of where you have to multiply the frequencies by the probabilities and that kind of thing. So, And as I was looking at the first example, there's some other prerequisite knowledge that I saw also. And that's independent events. Independent events. You need to know what independent events are because that's going to come up in one of the definitions. In addition to that, the probability of A and B and the probability of A or B. So I thought back to when I had statistics. And once we got to the binomial distribution, my grades kind of tanked. And looking back at it now, I realize why. I just got overwhelmed with all the stuff because I hadn't really retained all that stuff I had learned in the past. So there's a lot of stuff there. Probability of A and B, probability of A or B, independent events, factorials, binomial coefficients, probability distributions, 
it's expected that you know that stuff very well moving into this. And if you don't, then you're not going to have a clue. So we're going to take our time. Uh, we've got a week to get through this material. Uh, some of the new stuff's going to be kind of scary. Some of the old stuff should be kind of familiar. Um, truthfully, this binomial coefficients, they list it as, as prerequisite knowledge. I might be inclined to put it somewhere in between the two. It's because some of it's, to some extent, it's kind of new, but to some extent, it's kind of old, too. So, Are there any questions before we proceed? No questions. Okay. Well, first place to start then ought to be with this. Um, factorials. Factorials. Let n be any natural number. Let n be any natural number. n, like that, can be found by taking n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times da 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 And I always write this a lot different than most textbooks do. Most textbooks will just put a 2 and a 1 at the end. Okay, They'll just put times... 2 times 1. Okay. Yeah, that's times 2 and then times 1. I write it a little bit different than that. The way I express it is this. I will write it as dot, dot, dot times n minus n minus 2 times, in the last term, I'll write it as n minus n minus 1. And the reason I write it like that kind of helps explain why there's the one special instance of, of, natu or of, of a factorial that happens. And we've discussed it before, and we'll discuss it again because it's worthy of discussion. Uh, what's the smallest natural number? Smallest natural number is 1. Good. So there's an enigmatic idea that comes up. There's an idea that that's, it, it creates question. Zero factorial. What the heck does that mean and what the heck does that equal? Most textbooks, um, the way they write that times two times one, it, it kind of leaves it to, the, to your imagination. Well, it says for a natural number. Well, um, zero is not a natural number, is it? So... Technically, we shouldn't even be finding zero factorial. So maybe before we answer that question, we ought to say, what does it mean? A factorial, a factorial tells us in how many ways, in how many ways we can arrange n items. If we have n items, if we have one item, two items, three items, four, five, six, a thousand, two thousand. Notice none of those are fractions, none of those are negatives, but if we have a certain number of items, how many ways can we arrange them? So when we consider zero factorial, of course, then that means how many ways can you arrange nothing? It means how many ways can we arrange nothing? And you can't arrange nothing, so there's one way to arrange it. You don't arrange it. But zero factorial is one. It's one of those weird anomalies. It's something, it's a fact. Your calculator knows it, um, and you should too. It's weird. Uh, it, it all comes back to the definition of factorial. It means how many ways can we arrange a certain number of things. And, and by all rights, we shouldn't even consider it because technically if there's nothing, we shouldn't even be talking about arranging nothing. So, By the definition, again, going back to it, usually we're talking about arranging a natural number of things. One thing, two things, three things, four things, five things. 
I always like arranging letters. Example, how many ways can we arrange the letters? Got to watch myself here. H I S and T. How many different ways can we arrange those letters? Now you could write them all out if you wanted. The first way, well, you could have H I S T. And then the second way, you could have H I T S. And then the third way, you could have H I S. S, I said HS. You could have HS IT, or you could have HSTI. And you could keep on doing that, but I'm not going to because we don't need to. Right? Because we can use factorials. Here's one letter, here's two letter, here's three letter, here's four letter. So what we're really basically finding is four factorial. Right? Four factorial. How many ways can we arrange those four letters? Well, for our first choice, there are four ways. Wait a minute. What's he talking about this choosing? What's this come back to? Anybody remember what this comes back to? When there's four ways for the first choice, we used one of the letters, so there's three ways for the next choice. And then there's two, not combinations, but uh, not permutations, but there was a name given to this rule of how to count. It was just the multiplication counting principle or the counting rule, okay? Four times three times two times one, and that ends up equaling uh, four times three is 12, 12 times two is 24, and 24 times one is 24. So it's 24. There's 24 ways to arrange those, okay? We doing okay so far? So that's what a factorial is. If you've forgotten, your calculator's got a factorial button. Let me bring up both calculators. Every time I bring up the Inspire, it always takes weeks and weeks and weeks to load. So usually while the Inspire is loading, I try to tell a bad joke or something like that. A funny joke, a corny joke. Anybody know any? Did I ever tell you my joke about, um, about the computer code challenge? No, really? You've never heard the computer code challenge? Well, back in the day when computers were getting popular, um, there was two companies. Vastly different ideas on computers, but yet really similar. Anybody know the two companies I'm talking about? Macintosh and, and three letters, IBM. I can't believe you've all never heard this joke. So, this is when cable TV was getting popular. C-SPAN just came out. CNN. Robin Mead, I don't think she was around then. Um, anyway, uh, so these two companies, Macintosh and IBM, they decide to have a computer code challenge. And what they're going to do is they're going to get the best computers each company has. By the, for the record, by the way, do you know that... Uh, the first Macintosh actually had um, an interface that had various electronic windows in it. And somebody from IBM said, hey, we should call those windows. And they actually stole the information from Macintosh. So Mac had windows before windows had windows. True story. Anyway, um, so each team decided to get a representative they said, well, who can we get to represent us? Who could we possibly get to represent us? So you got Team IBM, and you got Team Mac, as in Macintosh. I'm a horrible artist, but as in Macintosh, Apple. So who's, who's going to represent each team? They could decide to get Jesus. Whoop. They decide to get Jesus and 
and the devil. They decide to get Jesus and the devil. So let's think about this for a minute. Who, who's going to represent Team Macintosh? Okay. So there we go. The devil's going to represent Team Mac. Jesus is going to represent Team IBM. So they need a, a location for this place, right? So they go to the West Coast. West Coast of America. That one state out on the West Coast. Looks like a banana, doesn't it? And somewhere there, they make all these silicone chips. Anybody know the name of the place where they make all the silicone chips? Silicon Valley, right? Silicon Valley. So there's lots of wide open spaces. So weeks and weeks and months and months before this, what they do is they congregate all these people. CNN's there, C-SPAN's there, NBC, ABC. I don't know if Fox was around yet or not. Anyway, they decide to have all kind of consumer trade shows. They have these little, Vegas gets in on the action. They have bets of who's going to win. And I mean, there's all, the Catholic Church has got like $2 billion riding on this. You know, that most of, most of it's on Jesus, but they have a side bet going too, just in case. Um, so anyway, uh, this is going to be a good, good thing, right? So they, it's, it's pretty cool what happens. They end up getting all kind of sponsors and all kind of different, you know, they, they get angels and demons to, you know, help sponsor each team. And, and the day of the competition, they actually open up the gates of hell and, and they little <laughs> whole bunch of people into like as spectators and stuff. It's pretty cool what happens. So um, I will come back to this and finish this joke, I promise. But before we do, uh, so on our TI-83, we want four factorial. So, so four, where do I get the factorial? Exclamation, which is where? I could go to, uh, I could go to catalog. And if I go to catalog, it's got to be somewhere in there. Catalog. I went backward in my catalog. Somewhere in here. There's all kind of weird characters. Oh, there it is. Four. It's 24. Okay. Uh, there's another place to get that. Uh, does anybody know where on the TID384? What class are we in? We're in stats, which is a math class. So let's press math. And what kind of math idea is this? It's a probability idea. So it's not a math math. It's not a number math. It's not a complex math. It's a probability idea. And there we go. Okay. Everybody all right? On the TI Inspire from a calculator page, here we go. We're going to, um, we're going to put in a four. And I could go to the catalog. He won't. Oh, there's my exclamation point right there. Uh, four is 24. There's another place to get it here. Uh, what should I do on the Inspire? I should press menu and then five for probability and then option one factorial. We're doing okay. Well, well, well. The next thing we're going to talk about is uh, binomial coefficients. Binomial coefficients. This idea is kind of new, kind of old. Binomial coefficients. Binomial coefficients. You've actually seen this before. It's just going to be a few different variables and a few different symbols. If n is a positive integer. In other words, it's a natural number. I don't know why the book said a nat uh, positive integer, but if n is a natural number and x and x is a non-zero integer less than or equal to n, then the binomial coefficient, the binomial coefficient, and here's where it gets weird.
this notation that I'm about to put up here in a second, it's really scary. So if n is a positive integer, in other words, it's a natural number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and x is a non-zero integer less than or equal to n. So if n is 8, then x has to be 8 or 7 or 6 or 5 or 4 or 3 or 2 or 1. You know what? I have a typo. I shouldn't have said a non-zero. I should have said a non-negative. Um, should have said non-negative. Sorry about that. X is a non-negative integer. Can't re read my own writing half the time. So if n is 8, then x has to be either 8 or 7 or 6 or 5 or 4 or 3 or 2 or 1. It could be 0. But either way, n is a positive integer, x is a non-negative integer. Then the binomial coefficient, and this notation is really weird. The notation is a parenthesis and a parenthesis. And there's two terms in here stacked on top of one another. We put n on top and then x below it. Okay. So that's the notation you'll see when you do the 5.3 homework. Um, don't let this notation scare you because in a second when you see the formula, you're going to say, you know what? You know what? I've seen that before. I've seen that somewhere before. I don't know where, but I've seen that before. It is defined as. So this is the way we define it. Here's the formula. The formula says the binomial coefficient can be found in this way using this formula. n factorial divided by x factorial times the quantity n minus x, the quantity factorial. Oh, wait a minute. That looks like something we've, we've seen before. That looks awful familiar. Why is n over x without a bar? What's going on here is on the left side, right here, this notation, if you were to read that notation and what that literally translated is saying, is that says the binomial coefficient. I know it's, it's really weird. It says that's not what that says. That says parenthesis and x parenthesis. In mathematics and statistics, that notation is shorthand for saying the binomial coefficient. Okay. It's really goofy, but um, it's just a, a notation thing. Okay. So as far as the formula goes, who can tell me what formula that is? I'll let you think about it, and we'll go back to the joke. It's actually no joking matter, but anyway. So here comes the day of the competition. You know what computer code is, right? Like if, then, and else's, and do whiles and loops, and all kind of stuff like that. Um, anyway, they decide they're going to have a contest to see who can write the most line of code. Every 30 minutes, they're going to check in and see who's winning. So, they get started. First 30-minute check-in. What did I have? I had the devil over here on the right. First 30-minute check-in, the devil's got a thousand lines of code. Jesus has a half of a line of code. Everybody's like, come on, Jesus! And obviously, you know, people came out of the gates of hell. They're like, you go, devil! Anyway, um, what happens, the devil, he's, he's going so fast, they actually had to stop and get him a new keyboard. The keyboard caught on fire, not because of his hands or anything, just because he was typing so fast. Um, so Jesus is, says, I, I'm just a carpenter. I don't know. I need, you know, he's hunting and pecking and... So anyway, they get the new keyboard, they get it all figured out, and this battle goes back and forth, back and forth. The next check-in, Jesus is up to three lines of code, and the devil's got 7,000 lines of code. Well, they keep on going. It's going to go till 6 p.m., and at 5.30, Jesus is starting to catch up. He's got 3,280,000 lines of code. The devil, he's got 10 billion lines of code. So they stopped for dinner. They said, we'll have a time out there. They stopped for dinner. And uh, anybody know what, what team Jesus ate? They had manna. 
and they weren't too happy about that, but that's another story. Um, Team Devil, what would have been a good meal for them? Ribs? Okay. Okay. So anyway, they resume, and what happens is at 5.50, all of a sudden, the sky turns black. If it starts rumbling thunder, and the devil looks at Jesus and says, don't be pulling any funny business. Jesus is like, I don't know what you're talking about. So they get down to a minute left, and, and Jesus is making a frantic comeback. And they get to start the final countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. So a bolt of lightning strikes the tower that the computers are hooked up to. Wipes out all the power, all the computers, and the devil's like, no! And he looked at Jesus and he's pointing his finger like, you did this! And he's like, I didn't do anything. I don't know what you're talking about. And the officials say, what we're going to do is we're going to get this sorted out. When the power comes back on, you'll have three seconds to recover your data. And we'll declare the winner. And the whole time the devil was just freaking out. No! No! So anyway. Okay, contestants, we've got the power restored. You'll have three seconds to recover your data. In three, two, Jesus pressed the button. The devil's like, no! One time. So they said, okay, here's the final results. With 5,286,334,221 lines of code, Jesus, the devil, zero lines of code. And everybody's like, no, how did he do that? Jesus saves. Jesus pressed the save button. Didn't see that one coming, did you? I got a request for my alpaca story. I have to tell you that later. Okay. So did anyone did anyone figure this out yet where this is from? What this is? Anybody know? Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Time out. Rewind. NCR. What's the formula for NCR? N factorial over N minus R factorial times R factorial. Wait a minute. Wait. Scratching my head. Playing with my chin beard that I don't have. Wait a minute. What's the difference between those two? Instead of an X, we use an R. And it's in a different place. But the commutative property says it really doesn't matter what order you put them in, right? So what formula is that, really? It's a combination. So when you're asked to find a binomial coefficient, can't you just use a combination? Sure. Check this out. So let's go to our first example. Example one, calculate. Example one, calculate. Let's calculate each of these. Let's go with a 6-1, a 6-1, and a 5-3, and a 7-3, and a 4-4. That was weird how the one thing turned up black. I have no idea what happened there, but my smart board... It's going to be one of those days with it. So the formula, the formula only goes like this. It's uh, n factorial over x factorial times n minus x, the quantity factorial. So if I look at this first one, I'll have 6 factorial over uh, x is the 1, so 1 factorial, and then times the quantity 6 minus 1, the quantity factorial. So that's 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 1 times 5 factorial, which would be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. This cancels with this. 6 divided by 1 gives me what? 6 divided by 1 is, thank you, 6. So that's my answer. Let's go to the 7 choose 3. That's going to be 7 factorial divided by 3 factorial times the quantity 7 minus 3, the quantity factorial. That's 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 3 times 2 times 1 times, what's 7 minus 3 give me? It gives me 4. And 4 factorial is 
four times, three times, two times, one. So the four on down cancel. Three times two is six. So this three times two will effectively wipe out that six. And seven times five gives me 35. Now, you might look at this and say, that's a lot of work. I don't want to do this. Fine. Don't. You know what you can use to do this, right? Use a combination on the calculator. Check it out. Um, seven, choose three. How do we do a combination? What was the, what did we type in for a combination? NCR. Good. So N C R parenthesis seven. Choose three. Hey, check it out. It's thirty-five. Thirty-five. What was the first one we did? Six and one. The question is why do why do we call this a different name? It's weird because in some contexts the mean is the mean, in other contexts the mean is the expected value. Statistics and mathematics, it's, it's about understanding the language. Um, they call the mean the expected value. And, and I look back at my stats days, and anytime I heard the word expected value, I just went, la, 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 la. It's just the mean. It's, it's, the, it's not to confuse you, it's, but it's in different contexts. It has a different application. So um, why don't they call it a combination? I don't know. I really don't have the answer for that other than the fact that, you know, they're just referring to a different... Um, different kind of stuff that you're doing with it, I guess. So, great question. Great question. So, is, is there or is there not something that can help us with all this? Is there or is there not some triangular shape that could help us find any combination we ever need to find? And it has a one at the top for the zeroth row. And then if we go to the first row, it's got a 1 and a 1. And then if we go to the, to the second row, it's got a 1 and a 2 and a 1. Anybody ever see this thing? What's this called? Third row, it's got a 1 and a 3 and a 3 and a 1. What's this called? It, it's the thing up on the wall. Yeah, it's Pascal's triangle. So then we got a 1... Four six four one, right? And a one five ten ten five one. Notice how it's symmetric. Notice how it keeps on keeping on. Let me let me put a few more things in this triangle here. I don't know if this will let me build this triangle any bigger or not. So after that. We would have 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, 6, 1. Isn't it cool how it's symmetric? So then we got 1, 7, 21, 35, 35, 21, 7, and 1. I don't know. The one on the wall keeps up. It goes up pretty high, doesn't it? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to consider this 7P3 or 7C3. 7 choose 3. I would like to indicate to you how you can interpret this. If we look at this seventh row right here, the first item means seven choose zero. Okay. The next item means, literally translated, seven choose how many? One more than zero. So seven choose one. Then the next item, this 21, is the same thing as seven choose two. So on that last problem we had, we, act, we were asked to find 7 choose 3, essentially, and it's that first 35 there. The second 35 is 7 choose 4. The second 35 is 7 choose 4. And it's, it's weird the, the reason the value is the same. Let's look at the calculations. 7 choose 3 and 7 choose 4. The calculations go like this. 7 factorial over 3 factorial times 7 minus 3, the quantity factorial, which is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 3 times 2 times 1 times, and 7 minus 3 is what? 4, and 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. On the other side here, we've got 7 factorial over 4 factorial times 7 minus for the quantity factorial, which is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 
4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And what's 7 minus 4? 3 and 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. So the stuff comes up in a different order, but it still, it's still the same stuff that comes up. Does that make sense? So it's weird. 7 choose 2 and 7 choose 5 end up corresponding. They have the same thing. 7 choose 2 and 7 choose 5 are both um, 21. So it's, it's weird, the symmetric nature of it. Okay. We're doing all right so far? Any comments, concerns, short debates? Well, in the time that's left, I think we're going to try to get this one last definition out of the way. And this definition goes like this. It's for Bernoulli trials, whatever the heck those are. Bernoulli trials. Bernoulli trials. Again, the names are kind of scary. All these are is repeated trials of an experiment. Repeated trials of an experiment. Now, with binomial distributions, the experiments have to be pretty special, and the definition of Bernoulli trials talks about how special they have to be. So it's a repeated trials of an experiment when the following, and there's going to be three of them, when the following conditions are satisfied. And here we go. There's going to be three conditions, and this will be it for the day. Condition number one, the experiment or each trial, the experiment or each trial, it's a binomial distribution. At some point, the word two's got to come up, right, for binomials? Okay. So it's an experiment that has... Two possible outcomes. If we think about flipping a coin, heads and tails, okay, so that would be a candidate. Now the notation here, we'll get that going, denoted S for success. Either we succeed or F for failure. So the notation, they're going to be using Fs and they're going to be using Ss. So S for success, F for failure. So that's one of the conditions. The trials have to only have two outcomes possible. Okay. The other two conditions include Something that we kind of mentioned before, the trials have to be independent. The trials are independent. Hopefully you remember what that means for events to be independent. And I don't think we'll have time to write out that third part to this today, so we'll probably wrap it up there. So tomorrow, next time we resume this, we'll talk about what it means to be independent, what are some examples of Bernoulli trials? Think about that. Next time we meet, we'll, we'll try to figure out what is a potential candidate for a Bernoulli trial. We already talked about flipping a coin. Can anybody think of anything else real quick where there's only two possible outcomes? Do what? Something where the only two things can happen. Winning or losing. You could tie in some stuff. But where only two things are possible. Anybody ever uh, think about being a salesperson for a living? Their pay scale is kind of weird. They make more if they sell something. So maybe you consider a, pay, uh, a, a salesperson. Either they sell something in a week or they don't sell something in a week. Right? So anyway, it's been real. It's been fun. Anybody want to give a shout out?
Shout out to Summer. Shout out to, to Babs. To who? Bomb Jeans. Trev Monster. Sips. Anybody else? Dan. Mr. Dependable. The future, Mr. Minnick. The past, Mr. Minnick. Anyone who doesn't hate Dan. Anybody else? Anna. Anders. Okay. Anybody else? I'll see you next time.